little background. Pacific Surfliner is a train. is a train that runs along the coast of Southern California from San Diego to San Luis Obispo. And as, as, as I was writing one day, actually down to do a presentation for Jessica Pressman, who Kate has mentioned, um, I realized that, it, that for people who lived in a certain era and in a certain place, that the train represented a kind of arrival and departure at each of the stops and that they punctuated in my life and in the life of many other people I knew from my place, my area, the, the main events in, in my life. Um, I had, I had um, and this, this piece is about having ridden on that train 60 years ago with my first um, love and, um, And having, and having taken my grandchildren there to the mission and having gone to the mission when I was very small with my own grandmother and so forth. Now, what this represents is a, a kind of feeling and, a, and, a, and, an, and, an, and an immersion, a, a participation immersion that um, one doesn't have to actually know all of the details either about the train or about my life or many other people's lives in order to feel that the movement, the stops, the sense of time passing and the uh, sense of both loss and regaining life are all present in the mix of image, sound, text, structure and um, movement. So I, so I, this can be performed or it can be read, and it can be read by stopping the video, of course, since it's on Vimeo, and um, and reading the text at some length. And of course, it it, it harkens back to John Zern's uh, question: "What does Elit ask of the reader?" And of course, it it does ask the reader to perhaps look at something twice, to pay attention to the details, to notice the juxtaposition between images and time passing and so forth. Um, I think that it, it, I have done several of these train videos now and they do represent a platform solution. They represent an accessibility solution. The piece I was going to play, which we're not gonna play, uh, is also available to you and you have the link to it. That was an earlier piece done in 2002 in Flash. And you might want to look at it because it's in the ELC collection one. I did it with Reiner Strasser, a, a gentleman, a wonderful artist from Germany. We had never met. We still have never met personally. It was a collaboration done entirely by email. It was done in Flash. Dini Grigar has put it into the Flash uh, repository because it was one of the actually rather rare pieces that could be reconstructed with a with a software called Ruffle. And the and the flash needed to be fairly simple and it needed to not go outside the flash into an HTML page. So I I encourage you to look at that as well. And I'm happy to answer questions and back to Kate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for us. Uh, yes. I'll show, yeah. quickly show one last piece, uh, and then we'll go to questions, if that's yeah. all right. Yeah, yeah. So we'll do share screen again. Yeah, you can screen it, yeah. It's activated, the option is activated. Okay. So the last piece I'd like us to look at is uh, called called Sea and Spar Between by Nick Monford and Stephanie Strickland. And it's a, another generative poem. This time it's based on a uh, mashup of Moby Dick by Herman Melville and Emily Dickinson. And that's a wonderful combination. There are a lot of tensions there, gender being one of them, male and female, 
uh, spatiality being another one, the expansive uh, landscape of Moby Dick versus the often closed in world of Emily Dickinson's poem, but that also reverses because there's the rendering room above the Pequod and uh, Emily Dickinson's poem, The Brain is Wider Than the Sky. So lots of thought went into this work. It's very jittery, as you can see here. It's composed of couplets that form a quatrain. And there's a fairly sophisticated poetry generator that chooses the vocabulary of the two writers. So I've written elsewhere about this piece and I'll just read a page or two about it. The project displays as an ocean on which quatrains appear as couplet pairs. The authors define location on the screen through latitude and longitude, and that's the box here at the bottom, both with over 14 million positions resulting in about 225 trillion stanzas, roughly amount they estimate of the fish in the sea. The numbers are staggering and indicate that the words displayed on the screen, even when set to the furthest out zoom position, and you can change the resolution on the screen, are only a tiny portion of the total conceptual canvas. The feeling is indeed being lost at the sea, accentuated by the extreme sensitivity to cursor movements, resulting in a highly jittery feel. It's possible, however, to locate oneself in this sea of worlds, words through the longitude, longitude position this move will result in the same set of words appearing on the screen as were previously displayed at that position. Conceptually then, the canvas pre-exists in its entirety, even though in practice, the very small portion displayed on the screen at any given time is computed on the fly. Because to keep this enormous canvas in memory all at once would be prohibitive. Strickland observes, quote, that the essence of the work is compression, drawing on computation to reduce impossibly large numbers to a humanly accessible scale. The effect is of a technological sublime, as the authors note in one of their comments. These terms signal we believe in abundance exceeding normal human scale combined with a dizzying difficulty of orientation. Um, so, Montford and Strickland have uh, instituted another very interesting practice with this, which is embedding a kind of essay in the comments of the code. So as you know, uh, comments in the code are non-executable statements, and they use that to create an essay they call spars of language lost at sea, pointing out um, that, for example, Randomness doesn't enter this work until the reader opens it and begins to read. It is the reader of spar and C, of C and spar between who is deposited randomly in an ocean of stanzas each time she returns to the poem. It is you, dear reader, who are random. An unusual feature is the display of the code source marked off by comments and that essay is entitled cut to fit the tool spun course. And it was also published separately in the Digital Humanities Quarterly. The comments make clear that human judgments played a large role in the text selection, whereas relatively more computational power was expended on creating the screen display and giving it its characteristic jerky movements. And here I'm now I'm reading from their uh, essay in the code line, in the comment lines of the code. Most of the code in C and SPAR, SPAR between is used to manage the interface and to draw the stanzas in the browser's canvas region. Only 2,609 bytes of code, about 22%, are actually used to combine text fragments and generate lines. The remaining, about 50%, deals with the display of the stanzas and with interactivity. But the authors gave a great deal of thought to um, how to generate these lines. Nick Monford is a computer programmer, uh, has a PhD in computer science, so he did most of the programming. 
But uh, Stephanie herself is a very talented poet. And it was her poetic sense, I think, that was especially crucial in uh, providing the fragments from Emily Dickinson's poetry. So with that, I'll stop the screen share. And uh, now we can go to questions and answers. Thank you, dear Kathleen, and thank you, dear Marjorie, for such uh, like uh, enlightening and insightful coverage and mapping of the past and the horizons of electronic literature. Uh, every, as I said before, every time we listen to you, we feel delighted. Now we open the floor to the audience, especially the students. I like, I would like the students to participate in this. So the floor is yours. In case you have questions or comments, yes. I think Mr. Monadel, yes? Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Uh, Mr. Walia, yes? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marjorie and Catherine. Um, I really appreciate and happy to be here because I was like expecting to see you people talking to me one day. <laughs> thank God that we are here today. Um, my my question is about how do we critique a work uh, of uh, generative literature uh, in the sense that because uh, most of them they have sold the authorship uh, to algorithm. Uh, Mario Spazaski will say that uh, uh, authors now have sold their right to <clears throat> To, to, to algorithm and bots, that and, and Twitter bots. So I would like you to just talk about this uh, because uh, many people are talking about um, uh, ab about uh, computer as being auto. So that's why that's what I want. I would like you to like throw your critique on it so that I can get more. Uh, clarity because of my thesis that I'm writing right now. I'm working on the Twitter bot. So, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, uh, thank you for that question. And uh, I'll offer a few thoughts and then perhaps Marjorie has some thoughts as well. So the general issue here, I think goes beyond uh, generative poems, although they're an instance of it. And the general issue is, what do you do when the surface text is unstable? What do you do when the surface text is constantly changing? So the traditional tools of literary criticism, close reading, for example, don't work very well. So there are a number of techniques that have evolved to deal with this problem. One is uh, the pathway solution where the critic does not uh, attempt to give a total reading of the work, but follows a certain pathway through the work uh, and uses traditional tools to understand the, the surface of the text. Another critical option that is available is to look at the code of the text and to critique it from the point of view of um, of code studies, which would include how tight the code is written, uh, how the choices were made for the vocabulary, how the lines were created. Um, and in the case of between uh, spar or C and spar between, uh, it's obvious that a good deal of thought went into how to create the specific lines that are generated there. Um, and the authors have a very specific rationale for what they do, did, and they emphasize the role of their intuition in figuring out how to create those compound lines. So you could also do a hybrid approach where you would take, for example, a, say four or five of the quatrains that are generated that you found particularly interesting, talk about the, the effect of putting together Dickinson's poetic uh, vocabulary with Melville's text, uh, and also look at the code to see how those joinings were actually uh, coded and what was the rationale for creating the kinds of lines that they did. Because as they explain in their essay, they um, 
they created five different templates for lines. So a lot of thought and of the computer design went into that possibility. So those are some ideas of how to, um, how to uh, think about an unstable text that is constantly changing and has no stable static surface to press upon in the usual way. And I'll invite Margie to make any comments she would like to make. I, I, I definitely agree with all of those approaches. Um, there is also the issue of can you read the whole text? And if you can't read the whole text, what happens to the meaning? And I think that a couple of people brought that up in the session with John, Dern, John Zern is, is the issue of, so does the meaning go away if in fact we can't get the entirety of the text as Kate was pointing out, if, even if it's moving, if it's unknowable such as see and far between, or if, for example, in a piece that I, a, a long narrative that I did, Philippia, most people won't read at all. Um, Kate did, but she's one of the few people in the world. Maybe more people have walked on the moon than have read all of Philippia. Um, <laughs> but I would say that the author is definitely, authors are definitely interested in meaning. And they do hope that the meaning in fact, will be part of a consideration of a critic, even with a movable text. And the way to approach that is, I believe, and this is what I've come to conclude over many years of both creating work and watching criticism and doing some myself, that the, a piece of electronic literature will tend to be, if it's well done, holistic, that is, what it is in any one corner is what you should find all the way through. There will be a consistency in approach in a sense of what it is the author is up to. And I think that um, critics should be able to relax their sense of, of one word being entirely important and perhaps look more holistically because we've got so many media operating at the same time and it isn't necessary to, ne to separate them into tiny bits, but rather to see the way they work together. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. Uh, let's move to Najla Ben Sheikh. She so wanna ask a question, Najla Ben Sheikh. Thank you first for giving us the, the opportunity today to uh, watch and to listen to this insightful yet informative presentations. Um, so my question is, um, since um, we have this digital literature and electronic literature um, is flourishing nowadays within this uprising of digital technologies, can we say that um, from, of course, from your own perspective, can you say that this digital literature will um, cover the gap of um, this writing scripts and so on? And can this digital literature have uh, a consequence or a bad influence on the writer on himself? This is my question. Thank you. Uh, can, you can you clarify for me why it could have a bad influence? No, I'm just like asking if it could have a, a bad influence. Oh, okay. Well, um, you might perhaps be thinking of um, young people who uh, stare at the screen for long hours, don't go outside, become antisocial, play computer games and so forth. Uh, and a lot, of course, has been written about uh, the dangers of over saturating oneself with screen displays. Um, but I think that electronic literature uh, has a different kind of, of mission. And that is to combine, as Sir Philip Sidney said several centuries ago, to combine entertainment value with educational value. And that uh, like all literature, it aims, just as Margie said, to have a meaning, to convey complex, uh, often ambivalent meanings. And uh, electronic literature read carefully and deeply has the same effect as print literature has to stimulate thought, 
to uh, catalyze questions, to critique cultural formations. And you see all of that in electronic literature. So um, I, uh, I, for one, think that reading literature is a grand vocation that uh, I've devoted my life to it. I think it enriches one's life, that it widens your horizons, that it gives you a whole uh, spectrum of vicarious experiences to help you understand the world better. And all that would be true of electronic literature as well. Thank you. Uh, I think there is another question from uh, Montasser, Montasser Hmela. Yes. yes you hear me? Uh, yeah, we hear you. We hear you. Yes. Thank you very much uh, uh, for this uh, very insightful presentation. Uh, we have really uh, discovered so many things with regard to the content and form of this, uh, but also history of this uh, new type of, of uh, literature. I have two main questions. The first one, uh, you, you have talked a little bit about this uh, first conference on electric literature in, uh, in Arabic uh, in Dubai, 2018. According to you, what is the significance of this conference, specifically when it is uh, organized in, uh, in an Arabic uh, country? So what is it, its significance in terms of, uh, of history, but also in terms of, uh, or with regard to the forming and the shaping of these courses in uh, Arabic thought? This is my first question. The second one relates to, uh, since, to the fact that since we are dealing with a new type of literature, which, uh, which is, which is multidimensional uh, in terms of meanings, uh, could you just uh, explain to us or provide us with, uh, let's say, uh, a strategy to how to approach the different meanings of, of this literature, that is to say, you have, for example, talked about a repertoire of signs, uh, multiple uh, uh, pathways, animations, and the music, and so on. So, so many uh, multitude of signs. So, how uh, can we, for example, as readers, as consumers of this uh, new type of literature, how how can we, for example, first of all understand, and then. Uh, uh, make sense of this, uh, let's say, uh, multidimensional literature. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you for those two questions. I'll answer the first and I'll give you a few thoughts on the second and then turn it to over to Margie. So um, the Dubai conference was in fact sponsored by my alma mater, RIT in Dubai. Uh, and I think that's part of the reason I was involved in it. And the great value of that conference, from my point of view, was to put into contact two groups that had little, if any, communication previously. For example, one of the things that I learned at that conference was that there is a, a society for electronic literature in Arabic. I didn't know that such existed. I was delighted to learn of its existence. And also, I was delighted to see some of the work that's being produced in uh, Arabic countries. Uh, so there were also a number of places where it became clear that the North American slash European contingent had significantly different ideas than the people coming from uh, UAE and other Arabic countries to that conference. For example, uh, something as simple as uh, does all electronic text count as electronic literature? So in North America, the unanimous answer to that would be no, by a no means. Not everything that's published on the web is, is electronic literature any more than everything published in print is, uh, is print literature. So there were, it was obviously some, um, a lot of cross currents, a lot of cross conversations that could profitably take place where each 
uh, party, we, if we can call them that, each party conveyed to the other what some of their foundational assumptions were. We had a chance to discuss a, a lot of that. The, there was sometimes some obvious tension in the, in the conference as a result of that, but I think on the whole, it was a, an entirely, uh, entirely good exchange because it enabled us to clarify some of our differences in assumptions as well as uh, much of the overlap. Now to your second point, how do you criticize a multimedia uh, work such as most works of electronic literature commonly are now? So you've got animation, you've got images, you've got sound, you may have music. Um, how do you put all that together? And I think, um, I think that this really stretches the repertoire for literary critics who are used to text-based criticism. But we already have a lot of examples in the art world of how you deal with images, rich traditions of critical interpretation from the whole area of film studies. We have a lot of rich uh, traditions about how you deal with animation, how do you deal with time-based works and so forth. Same from sound studies. So I think to uh, be a practitioner in this area, you have to be somewhat of a bricolure. You have to be willing to dabble in other fields other than literary criticism to become conversant with some of those other modes of how you undertake critique and uh, then to bring them to bear uh, upon these rich multimedia works. So that raises immediately another question, which is why classify this as electronic literature? Why not classify it as video as the piece Margie showed could uh, easily be considered video? And I think that uh, is primarily a tradition-based decision. That is someone coming from sound studies would find something very different in Margie's piece than I do coming from literary studies where the emphasis is primarily on text. Um, I don't necessarily see that as a problem. I think uh, it's a case, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom that uh, let everybody uh, pitch in and, and from their own tradition speak forcefully about what they find riches in, in these works. Thank you so much. Uh, we still have seven minutes, I think. So we will take a couple of questions. Uh, like, I, I would like, I would like to, I would like to. Yes. Yes. Add, add an addenda to Kate's issue about meaning, if that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I would like to say that when we look at traditional literary criticism, we often don't go back to how it is we arrive at literary critical positions about uh, regular linear text. But my part of my experience as both a writer and a student of literature and teacher of literature is that the the one of the things that generally happens with a print text is that we work backwards. That is, a person reads text X, text X, they decide what they think it means, and then they work back into the text to show how that meaning was created. So they say, well, look at all the dark night scenes and look at how the light flickers and look at the way the characters only walk softly and so forth. In other words, we work backwards. And I think that that's a perfectly fine way to work with electronic literature as well. Most people can take a meaning from a piece of electronic work that they look at closely two or three times, and then they can go back and see how that meaning is created by the author. Thank you, thank you. We will have another question from uh, Jeremy. Jeremy, yes? Jeremy, do you hear me? Yeah, sorry, I was yes. eating. Yeah. I was eating my <laughs> breakfast. <laughs> first of all, hi, Marjorie. Hi, Catherine. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. You're the first person to write about my work 20 years ago. Much, much thank you. Um, what, it's a two-part question. 
Sorry, I'm still chewing. That's rude. What what threads and progressions have you seen over the waves of electronic literature that you found interesting, and especially now with the discussion, especially for me, I'm also a short story writer and novelist. What threads have you found within the confines specifically of the possibilities of electronic literature and how it kind of, I guess, cross-pollinates among the larger sense of literature? And then the second part, if there's time, is what could be a fourth wave? But I guess that's less important, but thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for that uh, question, Jeremy. And I'll, I will say that I think uh, electronic literature is, um, it's difficult to write long narratives successfully in electronic literature. I think Margie's work here is exemplary because it's uh, a case of doing that successfully. But there's a reason why the form in general has been uh, predominantly going to poetry and short narratives, even visual narratives, instead of long uh, fictional narratives. Um, so I think that is a, is a very noticeable trend as to what the fourth wave could be. If I knew the answer to that, I would be a lot richer than I am right now. <laughs> so I, I'll, I'll leave that uh, to the audience to speculate. But I also saw another question in the, in the chat that I, I would like to respond to if that's possible. Murat, is that yes, yes, it's possible, of course. Okay, so this question was about uh, post-human studies, with which I, as you know, may know, am associated. Uh, and what about post? What about the post-human component of electronic literature? And I think um, there is, of course, a technological component to print literature as well. And studies of the book have done exemplary jobs of exploring that. But with electronic literature, I think for the first time we can say that the different software packages that creators use have a claim to be collaborators, not merely affordances, that in all kinds of ways they, uh, they have influence on what the product looks like. And um, as I've argued recently and am still arguing in the book I'm working on now, I think that we can think of computational media as having cognitive abilities. So I think there is a fundamental shift there that has deep theoretical implications that I won't have time to go into here, but I think are fascinating to explore. And I'll ask Margie if she has any comments. Well, I, I certainly agree with, with, the, with the issue that, um, that, the, that the software and the platform and the anticipation of how it is that you're going to be able to share it at all um, are powerful partners in whatever is created. In fact, it, they are so important in terms of how it is you say what you say and how that gets, how that influences the message altogether, especially since we're talking about working backwards from the message um, that I would agree with Kate that they, they are collaborators in many senses and certainly they exert their own intelligence or their own, uh, their own particularities into anything that, that an author attempts. Thank you.